All right. So let's get going here with um, kind of part two of time period six, uh, which is the Gilded Age. And the focus of our lecture today is going to be about industrialism. So again, when we define the Gilded Age, for me, I think the biggest takeaway is this is where kind of America becomes recognizable to young students of history. Uh, I think there's this kind of general perception that uh, in the Civil War and prior to the Civil War, there's a history that seems um, almost irrelevant, uh, um, that, that we can't quite identify with. Uh, and following the Gilded Age, we have an America that has been industrialized, um, that has witnessed rapid uh, population growth, the growth of a modern industrial economy, um, this uh, network that has uh, been built uh, with respect to transportation and communication across this nation uh, whose destiny has been manifested. And it looks like and feels like an America that is more modern in many senses that we you know, recognize and identify with at a more visceral level. At the same time, the Gilded Age, we will prove, is an America that is also recognizable in its inequities. Um, and so we're going to be careful that we don't just define uh, America as this bright, shining beacon uh, for the rest of the world, as it often gets defined, including in some resources that I'm going to point to us today. What are the causes of the rapid industrialization? Uh, well, there's the steam revolution of the 1830s to 1850s uh, prior to the Civil War, uh, fueling the railroad growth. Um, the railroads are the first major business in the United States. Uh, they draw incredible financial investment. They are the key to opening up the West. Uh, they are key to manifesting destiny. Uh, they are the key to developing many other industries. Um, there's significant technological innovations. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Bessemer process today, the advent of refrigerated cars, uh, electricity, Thomas Edison, um, and all his great inventions, even if maybe they weren't all just his. Um, the abundance of uh, skilled and unskilled labor through uh, the uh, rapid period of immigration that we're going to witness during this time period, you know, kind of 1865 to 1900. Um, a government uh, that is uh, significantly intervening, but in the name of uh, commerce and aiding this business expansionism. Uh, this growing class of entrepreneurs that we'll talk about today, guys, like eventually Henry Ford, but uh, Rockefeller and Carnegie and Vanderbilt, um, the abundant natural resources uh, that are present throughout this nation now that uh, America has in fact manifested this destiny from sea to shining sea. So there's all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, ingredients creating this perfect storm for America to witness arguably uh, the greatest period of economic growth that the world had seen uh, all around the globe uh, at any point in history up until the end of this time period around 1900. Um, so we call it the Gilded Age. Uh, it's a, it's a coin, uh, a phrase coined, excuse me, by Mark Twain uh, that is representative of America during this time. It is uh, said that it looks like this beautiful, shiny apple. But as I hinted earlier, there is a rotten core on the inside. Um, so we have this notion, right, of the Gilded Age being defined by these extravagant displays of wealth, this expanding economy, um, the, the, the growing population, uh, and from an outside perspective, without digging too far, the economy is, it, it looks great. The country looks great, but it's just gilded, meaning that it's just covered in a thin layer of gold. 
Um, hidden on the inside is all sorts of uh, political corruption that we're going to get into. We got into that a little bit with Ulysses S. Grant being one of the most corrupt presidents in U.S. history. Um, the greed on uh, easy display from uh, the, the robber barons, as Howard Zinn would call them, uh, this period of child labor, of uh, uh, exploitation of the environment, uh, this period of racial discrimination. So uh, the Gilded Age says to us that uh, we have the appearance of, and in fact, yes, this rapid economic growth and this uh, wonderful country being formed, but um, not everything is immediately apparent. We have to go digging a little bit deeper uh, into that story to understand how uh, this country sustained that type of growth. So the components that go into the Gilded Age, of course, include the industrialization that we're going to get to today, um, but the urbanization of America and all of the pitfalls that go along with that, which include uh, immigration and the role that immigrants play uh, in the economy. Uh, the economy, of course, is built on uh, the backs of those immigrants, um, how those immigrants live in cities is going to be a big theme that we should uh, get into. Um, discrimination uh, that we talked about right in, in this Jim Crow era, of course, is, is still where we are. We opened up our class with that today. Discrimination in the South, discrimination in the West, the political corruption, uh, and this notion of populism that we'll define a little bit better when we get into politics of the Gilded Age. So all of these components together give us the America that is being formed. But again, at the end of the day, from the outside, what's fascinating to me is that when we look at the Gilded Age from like a bookend perspective, um, the history prior to the Gilded Age is intangible to us, right? It, it's ancient. We see a population that has uh, no electricity, no refrigeration, no indoor plumbing. Uh, they have uh, heat by perhaps kerosene or just wood. Uh, it's a horse and buggy uh, transportation system. Uh, you know, even those first turnpikes that we talked about were traversed by horse and buggies. We actually, you know, the, the idea we talked about before early industrial revolution of any kind of hard surfaced road uh, for horse and buggy was, was considered progress. Um, the communication uh, and the transportation uh, was ancient from our perspective. And when we look at the later bookend of this period, right? Uh, we have refrigerated railroad cars. We have cities with sewer systems and sanitation systems. There's electricity and power stations and lamps and fans and appliances and typewriters and uh, instantaneous communication with uh, telegraph and telephone and transportation where we can traverse this entire manifested nation in, uh, you know, about a week. Um, and all of this makes the, uh, the, the lives of Americans uh, easier uh, and more comfortable and, again, more identifiable. Um, but, again, be careful how we define Americans, right? That uh, many Americans are doing the work but not necessarily reaping the benefits. Uh, the benefits brought to us by a whole host, though of new industries, the railroad industry, the oil industry, uh, the, the mining and the, uh, the natural resources we saw on, on the map that I showed you a little bit ago, including beef and cattle out west, uh, the construction business taking place and booming all over the nation. We have uh, that American city that I talked about, but no longer relegated just to the American uh, Northeast, right? We have uh, the boom towns because of mining in, in mining in uh, places like Denver and San Francisco following the gold rush. Um, and so uh, there's uh, a, a rapidly and widely expanding economy. Uh, key inventions from a consumerism uh, perspective, and that's going to be a major theme as we kind of traverse through this time period. 
again, what makes this uh, relevant to us, right, is that if you look here from 18, uh, you know, 48, 1860 here, uh, to 1900, uh, the invention of the elevator. We're going to talk more about the Bessemer process, uh, the typewriter, the sewing machine. Levi blue jeans come about here in the mid uh, mid Gilded Age, 1873. Uh, the telephone, uh, music, the phonograph. Okay, um, as we said earlier, the uh, electric light bulb, uh, the zipper on the Levi jeans. Um, the the radios uh that kind of tie culture together uh late in the time period uh the cities have uh systems like subways uh new york city is the first one to have uh subways and electricity uh so there's 500,000 patents uh issued over these 100 years when we bookend the entire period um but again this is when america becomes recognizable um some companies that are still with us right uh coca-cola the birth of the american skyscraper the airplane follows shortly after the gilded age uh specialty stores and department stores coming about um so this notion of american consumerism uh is really born during the gilded age uh the advertising industry is born during the gilded age some of the stores that come about are still with us today uh or maybe are just recently uh finally e experiencing enough uh you know economic uh difficulties to kind of go under right so we know that jc penny and macy's and sears are kind of struggling today uh but that was a heck of a run for a brick and mortar as we call them today, uh, department store. So uh, it's it's an amazing period of uh, economic growth, expansion, and uh, modernization. Okay, um, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the the characters that are going to do this building, the actors and the players here. When we get into some of those quote unquote robber barons. Um, the, uh, the expansion of industry, the advent of electricity. And of course, I don't think we can overestimate the importance of the age of railroads. Um, first on to electricity, right? We mentioned Thomas Edison. Um, by the time we get into the 1900s, most every major business and business sector is uh, going to require electricity to run their machines. Uh, this was uh, an adaptation of this great technology uh, that was uh, pioneered by Thomas Edison. Now, you know, historians look at Edison today and um, some would castigate him as a little bit of a, of a villain for having stolen a lot of patents. Uh, others would tell you that, yes, but it's not all that bad, uh, regardless uh, the advent of electricity is instrumental in uh, advancing this time period. Uh, another major development, of course, is oil, um, or, you know, still obviously uh, so crucial to the American and, for that matter, the worldwide economy uh, called black gold. Uh, and significant deposits of it are found in Texas. Um, there had been prior to the Gilded Age, right, uh, the uh, small capacity production of kerosene for lamps, but the steam engine, we talked about that steam revolution of the 1830s to 1850s, uh, is, is uh, harnessed to drill for oil and uh, removing oil from the earth uh, becomes practical uh, for large scale production. Uh, in the probably really on a widespread basis uh, during uh, late Civil War era. Um, and of course, that's going to fuel the automobile industry, which is going to take off, as I said earlier, just after the Gilded Age. So again, we're looking at this as kind of like a bookend period, right? One of the most significant um, developments here is by an inventor uh, that we may not have heard of so much. Perhaps you studied him in world history, and that's Henry Bessemer. So Henry Bessemer uh, in the 1850s devises a way to convert iron into steel 
uh, on a large scale basis. Uh, he, his invention involves blowing air through molten iron in a, a converter or a furnace, burns off the excess carbon, and the creation of steel leads to uh, uh, yet another revolution during this industrial age. Steel is used uh, for barbed wires out west, which eventually is really going to kind of cause the death of uh, the uh, the myth of the American cowboy, right? Um, to uh, to build farm machines, uh, to build skyscrapers, and of course for railroads, which are going to be so significant. Um, skyscrapers are going to begin to dot the skylines of major cities from New York to Chicago to San Francisco. Um, and this is going to take place as a result of the Bessemer process, really kind of be beginning about the 1890s into the 1900s. Uh, and so the American, very much the face of the American city will be transformed because of the Bessemer process. Uh, and as I said, um, uh, used to build railroads as well. So uh, the railroads are gonna play a role, the Bessemer process is gonna play a role. Um, in the industrial age ability to extract those natural resources that are present in uh, this great resource we have right from coast to coast. Uh, coal is going to power factories and steam engines and later electricity. Um, the, the railroads, uh, of course, are uh, huge. Um, the wedding of the rails, that transcontinental railroad, is finally completed in 1869 in Promontory, Utah. Uh, the wedding of the rails. Um, the Pacific Railway Act of 1862, and again in many subsequent years, uh, gives railroad companies uh, massive federal loans uh, and land grants in exchange for the railroad construction. Um, just feeding into uh, the tycoons and the robber barons that own the railroads, uh, guys like uh, perhaps uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Um, a couple other uh, transcontinental railroads are going to be built as well. So we have a Northern Pacific, a Union Pacific, Atlanta Pacific, and a Southern Pacific Railroad. Um, and this is going to continue to uh, fuel the growth of, uh, again, other industries on which goods are being shipped on the railroads, uh, the construction of the railroads itself, uh, and of course, into westward expansion. So by uh, 1890, uh, railroads will connect almost all parts of the country. Um, the railroad construction plays a, a massive role in uh, changing the demographic face of the nation. We know that out west, you probably already know, right, the importance of uh, Chinese labor uh, in, and Chinese immigration in, in uh, completing uh, the Pacific uh, wing of the railroads, if you will. Um, Irish immigrants uh, doing the same in the east. Um, and uh, it's dangerous, dangerous work. So again, kind of part of that Gilded Age theme, right, is the exploitation of this new class of immigrants, um, Chinese in the West, Irish in the East that come in uh, and for the, the promise of economic opportunity to work on the railroads uh, and they achieve it, but oftentimes at significant cost uh, for very little wage and at the risk of life and limb. Uh, interesting side note that I think is really neat is that uh, it's during this time uh, that the time zones in America are first developed. Prior to the Gilded Age, uh, traversing the nation, uh, if done at all, would have done, uh, would have been accomplished very slowly, right? Uh, again, uh, horse and buggy, essentially, and for a long time uh, on no hard surfaced roads. So you, you know, it would have taken uh, a multitude of weeks uh, to travel across the country uh, if you were going to undertake that kind of journey at all. It was uh, incredibly arduous and uh, you would go day by day. But now that the country can be traversed in a matter of seven to 10 days um, and 
were traveling essentially with the sun, you see the creation of time zones in America. Um, along with all of this uh, industry coming alive um, because of the railroads, uh, there's also incredible corruption. Remember at this point, and we're going to get later, uh, kind of post-Gilded Age, we're going to get to the introduction of this progressive era reform. And I think I will probably su successfully belabor the point that in American politics, we'll see kind of a pendulum swing over the course of history where uh, industry is incredibly favored and the working classes are incredibly exploited. And then we're going to kind of have a pendulum swing, right, when we think about right and left politics. Um, and there will be a series of times when America will begin to look after the exploited workers and at least try to put in some measures to tap the brakes, at least, on capitalism. Um, during this first time, this gilded age, uh, it's all gas, no brat, no, no breaks, baby. Um, and, uh, there is widespread, incredible corruption during this time. We already talked, of course, about the credit mobile scandal. And remember what that was all about was, um, Grant and most of his, uh, presidential employees, uh, becoming wealthy off of the grift associated with the railroad industry. Um, they uh, would, uh, you know, have these public bids for the railroad contracts. Uh, and typically one firm, Credit Mobile, would get most of uh, the contracts. They would build for X, you know, uh, but really having won the, the contract for you know, two, three, four, five, ten times that amount and give kickbacks to Grant or other politicians involved, uh, this becomes kind of a widespread practice. And there's virtually no checks on, you know, the stock market that's born during this era, uh, no checks on uh, these federal contracts that are given. So corruption is incredibly widespread. There was a wonderful series. Uh, it's I think it's still available on Amazon Prime called Hell on Wheels. That's all about the construction of uh, the railway. Uh, they're getting towards the, the, the wedding of the rails. Um, but this westward expansion uh, construction of the railway that takes place post-Civil War. Um, and it's an incredible series, if a little bit violent and a little bit eye-opening for its uh, exposition of the corruption that takes place, um, really focusing on the Union Pacific Railway line, which you see mapped out here. You'll also notice this is a link. If you click on that link, um, I've got a kind of, it's a, it's a link to a little bit from the Hell on Wheels. Uh, and quite frankly, it's a little bit of a hype film for the series. Uh, really, really well done, and uh, perhaps with parental permission, uh, I would recognize that uh, and uh, and recommend uh, that you check that out. So um, another series that's out there that I think you might really enjoy, and I just checked this morning and kind of started it again myself, is uh, a series on Amazon Prime called The Men Who Built America. So there's another link on this slide here that talks about uh, the Commodore, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Yes, that Vanderbilt as in Vanderbilt University. Um, and showing, uh, I think this clip will show, and certainly the series will show, kind of how ruthless and cutthroat the business practices are of uh, these great American tycoons, or again, as Howard Zinn would call them, the robber barons. Um, so I would recommend you check this one out as well. Uh, the last clip on Hell of Wheels is probably about four minutes or so. This one here is three minutes. I've got another one coming up I'll recommend to you as we get into this topic of kind of otherwise examining uh, corporate America. And what we're really talking about here is uh, the birth of the major American corporation. Uh, one of the first ones, of course, is uh, Standard Oil, uh, John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil. Um, and, uh, and how those corporations get built 
Uh, so let's talk about it. Okay. So these modern corporations um, emerge when uh, the stock market takes off. And again, we have unbridled, unchecked capitalist growth uh, during this post-Civil War period. Uh, and so the modern corporation emerges as these companies began to sell stock to ordinary Americans as uh, a source of investment, right? And we know how stocks work, I hope. You're kind of gambling on a company. You are buying a share of a corporation with the hope that that corporation is going to do well, is going to expand, and is going to uh, increase the value of that stock that you gave them. So when you buy a stock, you're giving capital to this corporation, the idea being they're going to do so well, if you ever want to sell that stock, the stock you bought at X will be worth Z, right? And so corporations are able to raise large sums of money during this time. No shock, I think, that one of the first major corporations uh, to take advantage of this structure of capital uh, fundraising is uh, a railroad company. It's the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. It's the first railroad company to adopt this system. Um, and uh, Andrew Carnegie uh, becomes the first robber baron uh, by buying out uh, a lot of his competition. Um, he is a legit example, I think, of kind of a rags to riches uh, success story in, in America. Sometimes we often, I think, prescribe too much to, you know, this notion of like picking yourself up by the bootstraps and working your way out of poverty. Um, but during this time period, it's, it's somewhat legitimate, uh, when we see these early tycoons and Carnegie being one of them. Um, so how these companies continue to grow at a rapid clip and be so successful is essentially by undertaking uh, one of two forms of integration, okay? Um, how they grow. Horizontal immigration is when one company would buy out other companies that engage in the same business or enterprise. Uh, so that is to say, you know, an oil company that buys out other oil fields is engaging in horizontal integration, okay? Um, a railroad company that buys out other railroad lines and other access to railways is engaging in horizontal integration. Vertical integration is when companies take over firms that they would otherwise have to outsource or rely upon for their primary function. So uh, that would be to say that if a um, oil firm uh, needs to move its oil to sell its oil, uh, then it would buy railroad companies, okay, so that they can they no longer have to negotiate or work with railways to move their own product. Uh, they move their own product on their own railways. Um, one of the uh, best examples of um, both of these types of forms of uh, uh, corporate growth in America is uh, actually John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company. So what he does is he's buying other uh, oil fields and oil production services. He's also buying uh, the types of companies that would build uh, the oil drills. He's getting into the railroad business itself. And so Rockefeller, obviously a name we still know, uh, becomes a significant tycoon, as it were. And Standard Oil is Rockefeller's uh, major firm. Um, it grows throughout the 1870s and the 1880s as uh, Rockefeller buys other oil companies and engages in vertical integration here, um, engages, as I said, in horizontal integration as well. By the end of the 1800s, by about the turn of the century, Rockefeller is going to control 90% of the refined oil in the United States, all by his lonesome. Uh, and Standard Oil is going to become like the leading symbol of a monopoly in the United States. And you can imagine the power that comes with that kind of uh, economic girth. So he is able to 
Uh, as we see in the Gilded Age, he's able to exploit his workers. There's essentially no competition, right, in a monopoly. Uh, workers can't find other, you know, take their knowledge and uh, their assets and go work for another oil company. Rockefeller controls it all. He's eliminated all of his competition. Uh, he's able to dictate prices, right? Um, and with that kind of control over such a significant uh, industry, as America is becoming more and more oil dependent, Rockefeller will, of course, have incredible power, not just economically, but also politically. Uh, and this is where we see for the first time kind of that kind of gravitas uh, pulled by uh, private investors and private businessmen becoming really more powerful than politicians in American history for the first time. And we'll talk a little bit more about the cartoon you see here to represent Standard Oil in a second. Uh, but first, I've got about another three minute clip here uh, from the men who built America on John D. Rockefeller from Standard Oil. And so I would ask that you pause and check that one out as well. This is our third now and final video of the day. We've got Hell on Wheels. Uh, we've got the, uh, uh, the, the video on Andrew, uh, or sorry, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Uh, from the men who built America, and here's John D. Rockefeller from the men who built America. Um, as you see in this cartoon uh, representing Standard Oil, or if perhaps if it were a better copy, what you could see is here is uh, the the oil company, Standard Oil. You see an oil rig here, and they have grown so large, right, and so powerful uh, that. The representation here is that during the Gilded Age, these massive monopolistic corporations kind of have their tentacles in every single facet of American culture and society. In this case, you see the tentacle already wrapped around Congress, right? The, the power, the political power that is wielded by such uh, a significant economic giant uh, and you see another tentacle about to grab uh, the White House. So it's a, it's a fascinating time and a, and a fascinating aspect of the time to consider when uh, we consider kind of the unchecked growth of the monopoly, absent, right, any real political will to otherwise get involved. So at best, the American government is kind of laissez-faire about uh, intervening on behalf of those exploited workers. Uh, at worst, they are absolutely benefiting themselves from uh, a symbiotic relationship uh, by uh, allowing this unchecked growth um, and even um, engaging in corruption to get there, okay? So that's really what we mean, uh, A, in defining the Gilded Age and B, in understanding uh, industrialism. Um, and, uh, and we'll get into other topics that we kind of touched on today, including as we just were talking about politics, but uh, urbanization and immigration, uh, the notion of westward expansion, uh, and really kind of America growing up as a nation, because what we're going to see in the time period following isn't just that kind of early progressive era that I hinted out and the pendulum is going to swing, but also as America is growing its economy at such an incredibly rapid and significant clip, uh, you're going to see America itself do the same thing. And so America politically and on a worldwide stage as a result of what we see during this Gilded Age is also going to become this America that we recognize as uh, a primary player in the world. Um, I would absolutely recommend Hell on Wheels. I haven't checked yet today to see if that is actually still out there. I know it was. Um, I'm sure, I, I sure hope it is. I'll check it out in a minute. Uh, but I do know that uh, this series, The Men Who Built America, is out there. Now, I would caution you, if you watch The Men Who Built America, uh, these business tycoons are absolutely uh, portrayed as kind of heroic figures. 
uh, certainly ruthless in doing so. Um, but on the flip side of that coin, of course, is the exploited America. Okay, so you're going to see some of the gilded here, uh, some of that bright, shiny apple, but you're not necessarily going to see the effects of this massive accumulation of wealth uh, by only a select few and uh, the rising uh, economic inequalities that take place as a result. Nevertheless, it's a really good series. Uh, you'll uh, recognize uh, several of the uh, uh, modern interviews that take place. Donald Trump gets interviewed here, Rudy Giuliani, uh, Mark Cuban, uh, many other names that you'll probably recognize, but it's a pretty cool series. Uh, we could uh, flip the script a little bit, and I have linked on this slide for you uh, chapter 11 from Howard Zinn, Robin Bearers and Rebels. And uh, this is a really good chapter. Um, I know not everyone here is a huge uh, Zinn fan, just because, quite frankly, I think because it's a lot of reading. But the concept of what Zinn does is absolutely fascinating. Again, where he is willing to look at history from the perspective of the loser. So there's plenty of history written by the winner, right? That series, The Men Who Built America, uh, certainly treats the robber barons as heroes. Uh, Zinn wants to look at the exploited classes, uh, the Chinese immigrants, the Irish immigrants, uh, the systems that are put in place and the actions taken to keep those populations down. And then, of course, we're pitching down the middle. Uh, everything we're talking about here with time period six with respect to the Gilded Age, I believe you're going to find uh, the vast majority of that in uh, chapter 24 from our textbook. So I would ask you to check out uh, all of that stuff, man. Check out Hell on Wheels. Check out The Men Who Built America. Check out uh, Howard Zinn and check out the American pageant. Um, that's all I got for you today, and uh, I hope you picked something up. Thanks, guys. Take care.